Good morning. My name is Connor Jackson. I'm a pediatric ENT surgeon working here in Sick Children's Hospital in Belfast. I've been asked to chat today about front of neck access in a pediatric emergency patient, uh, and obviously it's a difficult subject. The one bit of the of the title I wasn't particularly happy with was tips from an expert, and usually it's a good thing to be an expert. But in this scenario, I'm going to explain why I hope that I don't see this type of scenario very often. Um, and that there are some things we can do in the assessment of children and in their management to hopefully avoid those really critical uh, episodes. So I suppose my disclaimer today is that I am not an expert and I'm thankful about this. But why am I talking to you about it? Um, because as a paediatric ENT surgeon, we do deal with difficult airways on a regular basis. This is a, a, a video of a young baby who is in theatre, obviously. I've got my really skilled anaesthetist at the top end of the table, and it's obvious that she's in some airway distress. And we can see pectus, we can see her working hard. There are lots of uh, lines and tubes coming in and out of her. Um, but on the whole, we're pretty relaxed. We're doing all those simple things that you'd want us to do in that sort of situation. She has a bilateral vocal cord palsy, um, but we're able to oxygenate her, and we're, we're able to control the situation. The good thing for the majority of us working in paediatrics is that really critical paediatric airway emergencies are incredibly rare. Uh, for all you clever guys that have got a reference in my talk, um, this is from a study that was done in Melbourne Children's Hospital over uh, a period of around four years. They looked at all the emergencies that were coming into the unit and they found that this happens through a &E about once every two months, so pretty infrequently. And the vast majority of all of those cases, whether they be foreign bodies in the airway or trauma, were managed with simple APLS measures. So what might we see when we talk about children's airway emergencies? The obvious ones are foreign bodies which are inhaled. Then we've got inflammatory conditions such as croup. This x-ray shows a little metal ball bearing which had been aspirated into the left main bronchi. There can be cases of trauma, uh, their laryngeal trauma, although this is pretty rare in children given their anatomically high larynx. Uh, but we've got a case later on where we do demonstrate some significant trauma and how we might deal with that. Other cases that might be a bit more common, post tonsillectomy bleeds, uh, and as part of that, they can clot, and that clot may be aspirated, and that can be a very significant and, and difficult situation to be, deal with. Kids being kids, actually a lot of these cases are not going to have textbook answers. Kids are annoying and they do silly things. This is a picture of a three-year-old boy who was brushing his teeth uh, and came in with the toothbrush embedded in his left cheek. Uh, he just told us that he brushed his teeth incredibly hard. It was only a couple of weeks later when his sister owned up to pushing him off his stool in front of the sink. Um, any of these traumas or unusual things that involve the tongue, the lips, um, the oropharynx or penetrating injuries have to be dealt with in a slightly different way. Blood can complicate the, these views and because they are unusual, there isn't a protocol to deal with them, you do have to have a framework on which to base your management. So when thinking about this talk, it is unusual for us to have to do front of neck access in an emergency. So what scenarios might there be that I've encountered or that could be theoretically encountered by, by any of you guys? So foreign bodies which rest in the larynx are particularly difficult to deal with. On the nar larynx is incredibly narrow in, a, in the paediatric population and if something occludes that completely and sticks there, it, it's usually a very difficult situation very quickly. We have had incidents where there's a foreign body in the larynx which is very thin, such as a leaf or a sticker, uh, and they may present with, with some symptoms but not be critical. Unfortunately, if a child aspirates and the larynx is occluded, say, choking on, on a sweet or a sausage that doesn't move, those patients, unfortunately, often don't make it to accidents and emergency. Uh, other patients who might have swelling of the lips and tongue would be anaphylaxis. Um, and part of my job as a paediatric ENT surgeon would be to deal with lots of congenital 
uh, anomalies. This is a, uh, a very fancy fetal MRI scan. Um, and what it's showing is that the fetus here has a, has a complex congenital venolymphatic malformation involving the cheek, uh, the jaw, floor of mouth, tongue and neck. So obviously this is going to be a very complex condition to deal with and we need lots of planning put in place before the birth. And maybe even something like an exit procedure which is an ex utero intrapartum uh, treatment whereby the baby's partially delivered we deal with the airway whilst on uh, maternal placental circulation. Uh, other conditions such as Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome where they have a large tongue um, may present with acute airway obstruction in the neonate. Uh, our, our treatment of that is usually uh, a flexible nasal, uh, nasal tube. Historically, the big group of patients who required this uh, front of neck access were epiglottitis patients. Thankfully, since the advent of the Hib vaccine, this is really not uh, seen on a regular basis. So, when considering this group of patients, es essentially there has to be a high uh, obstruction with potential for normal trachea beyond the obstruction. Uh, and that's a very narrow group of patients. So, our main issue when dealing with all of these patients is that they have airway compromise. And really simply, the solutions are to oxygenate and secure an airway. Our acute management of these uh, conditions should be along the APLS principles. Um, and the biggest take-home message I have today is that it has to be a team-based approach. You have different skills, everybody has something else to add, but really the key guys are anaesthetists who may be in the hospital, uh, intensivists, paediatric nurse specialists, paediatricians, and also an ENT surgeon there if, if required. They can augment the a &E experience if a patient is coming in via that route or uh, often via the neonatologist in the, in, the, in the neonatology unit. Initial assessment is, is, is quick. This is often an emergency situation. Um, by the time ENT get phoned, uh, there's, there's often a fair bit of panic and distress. Often our first question is, have you contacted the anaesthetist? Who else is going to be there? We want to get as many hands uh, available as possible, as much expertise in the room. Um, so we'll ask for, for other people to be alerted and to come in whilst we're making our way there. For anybody who's on the ground, we ask them to listen to the chest. Uh, a silent chest is particularly worrisome. We'll ask them to look at chest movements, respiratory rate and also respiratory effort. First things first are to try and establish an airway and really simple measures would be uh, chin lift and a jaw thrust, bag and mass ventilation. If required uh, an airway ad adjunct such as a nasal uh, pharyngeal airway work really well and are simple to put in. Once the bag mask is ongoing, we'll give high flow oxygen and think about some medications. Those can be uh, steroid treatments or adrenaline in the case of an anaphylaxis. Uh, the next step, if that isn't working or if there's still jeopardy, is to consider uh, an ET tube or a surgical airway. So when we consider this, ET tubes are our best weapon. Uh, to get this done, I like to use a Miller blade uh, I'll have suction available, um, I'll have a selection of tubes, age appropriate, but if it is tight, such in the case of, uh, of a difficult croup, then we might want a half a size smaller. The tube can be loaded over a bougie to make it uh, stiffer, but in ENT, our little trick is often to remove the connector from the ET tube and then load the tube over a rigid endoscope. This can then be placed uh, under direct vision through the cords, looking at any pathology on the way, and then the tube slid off and the connector replaced, connected up to the ventilation circuit. This is not a baby, this is a rabbit. Uh, but what happens when things are going badly? Sometimes these measures just don't work and we are considering surgical access. Uh, when considering this, uh, 
it's really important to understand that surgical front of neck uh, techniques are a last resort. Death is imminent. imminent. Uh, it's a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario. Uh, if ENT are not around and you have a blue child and nothing else will do, that is the scenario to consider this. But it's important not to feel that you're alone. My advice is always, and if I'm doing this, my advice is always to ask everybody around the room, can you think of anything else? Do you agree with the plan? And once everybody ab agrees and it's time critical, try and get on with it as soon as possible. This is the slide that surgeons love and nobody else does. Uh, the picture on the left is really there to show that there is a lot of important stuff in the neck. And my advice would be to clear your mind and try and forget about just about all of it. Um, this is a life-saving procedure. Uh, the most important thing is accessing that trachea. It runs in the midline. There is less important stuff in the midline than laterally. So my advice when doing the procedure is to stick midline at all times. The picture on the right is to try and uh, reiterate that the child's airway is different than the adult. Uh, it, the neck is shorter and therefore we have to do our incision slightly lower down. Uh, the larynx is hidden a bit higher up and this protects it from trauma. Um, tongue is bigger proportionally. So there are some elements that you need to pay attention to. What methods can we use? So uh, probably the, the simplest method out there, which might buy us a bit of time, would be a ne needle cricothyroidotomy. And APLS will recommend that this is uh, this is performed from around five years of age onwards. Uh, other guidelines have suggested around eight years of age. It allows us to provide oxygen, but not to ventilate. Uh, if we're going to do this, uh, it's approached patient from above, as in the, the picture of the mannequin here. A uh, five mil syringe is loaded onto an 18 gauge cannula, and this is uh, inserted at a 45 degree angle, um, inferiorly whilst aspirating in the midline looking for some some air uh, uh, and that gives us the idea that we're in in the airway um, it's passed through the cricothyroid uh, membrane and in an emergent situation i do understand that this can be complicated and, and there may be a bit of doubt in your mind because it's not always particularly easy to feel in children uh, if you're looking for a spot usually uh, two centimetres above the, the sternal notch is a good starting point. Uh, once it's in, you confirm its position. Uh, some people have recommended having some saline in the syringe that bubbles can be, can be seen on aspiration. And once you've seen that, you want to attach the oxygen directly to the end of the ventilon. Percutaneous trachea is more often seen in adult practice. Um, it's really not recommended unless you've got a much older child. Uh, it's really only suitable for the, for the over 12s. You often need quite a bit of pressure and that can cause damage to the, to the underlying airway in, in very young babies. Um, the procedure is the same as we would use for adults. And if you've already done a, a needle cricothyroidotomy, that technique can be, can be converted. But on to the main event. So, Tracheostomies are performed by ENT surgeons on a very regular basis, um, but these are usually under very controlled conditions uh, uh, and they, they differ completely from an emergency procedure. Um, the good news is that ENT docs are usually fairly kind and they have an emergency tracheostomy set, usually in, in clear view in theatres at all times. So if you think you're going to require one, get someone to request the trachea set and there will be a, a tray delivered with all that you might need on it. Uh, it's important to get the positioning of the patient right. This is an Albert chin strap, so basically tape goes round the chin and secured to both sides of the bed, and that, uh, along with a shoulder roll, gives you good access. Um, Lignus band is probably not going to be of benefit in the real emergency, but if you have time, it's much more pleasant. Uh, you don't want to use too much because it can sort of disrupt your view. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a tube available. If there's no trachea tube there, an ET tube will do as a temporary measure. So in terms of what we normally do for tracheostomy, we define anatomy on, using skin markings first. 
we use a vertical incision in the emergency. Uh, it's usually positioned around a centimetre and a half above the sternal notch. The key aspect is to stay in the midline. This keeps you away from other important uh, structures such as the big blood vessels. And to do this, I often put a little small mark on the, on the chin, small mark on the sternal notch, just to make sure I don't start to deviate uh, when concentrating on, on the dissection. I wouldn't encourage you to drape um, because this can distort your, your view and the neath this needs to be able to see this baby as well. So as I mentioned, a vertical incision using a 15 blade. Uh, underneath the skin, there'll be a small wad of fat. We take this usually, but in the emergency, it would be straight down using blunt dissection uh, in the midline. I would encourage palpation as often as possible. You're feeling for those little rings. Uh, once you identify the trachea, it can be difficult to identify which rings are which, um, but we usually recommend between the second and fourth. The incision again will be in a vertical plane and once you have uh, identified the trachea, made the incision and uh, suctioned away any, any uh, secretions, at, at your tube can be inserted. This is a tracheostomy tube. When ENT put this in, we will confirm that there is a CO2 trace. It's also really important to hold this tube in place manually to make sure it's not dislodged accidentally until it's secured with some tapes. Uh, and then you can have a beer for a job well done. So, having discussed the procedure, it sounds quite daunting, and we know that we're not gonna see this on a regular basis. So how can we gain the skills required uh, in order to familiarize ourselves with, with a difficult procedure in a, an extremely difficult and challenging scenario? My recommendation is, is to use simulation. Uh, I know it's a hugely um, important topic uh, at the present time. I am one of the faculty in the Pediatric Airway Management course, which is run between Boston Children's and the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland every two years in Dublin. They have world-class facilities and high fidelity models, which makes practice easy. These are some simulation models um, provided by, by TrueCorp. This, is, this equates to about around a five-year-old child and anatomically we can use replaceable parts which give really good uh, experience in terms of how to feel for the cricothyroid membrane, how to orientate yourself and how to do the procedure uh, under stable circumstance. So uh, I've got a few cases here um, which describe when we might have an airway emergency and what steps we might do to secure the airway. Um, this is case one, which is a recent case. Um, a four month old uh, child with a golden heart syndrome, which is hemifacial microsomia and a cleft palate, had significant sleep apnea. They also had significant cardiac uh, history which needed a procedure performed in a different hospital. Before that procedure, we were asked to perform bronchoscopy. So these were the CT scans that we, that we had reconstructed beforehand. This demonstrates the right side uh, of the face is small. The TMJ is uh, dysfunctional. Uh, they have micronathia. And this is the, uh, my, where my advice would be, try and put a good plan in place beforehand. Uh, before her procedure, we discussed the case with our consultant anaesthetist and agreed that we would need two consultant anaesthetists in who have got airway experience. We got the difficult airway trolley out and we had a tracheostomy tray standing by. This is, these are some other scans uh, of the patient. So we can see on the top right of the picture, the small jaw. Uh, the scan on the left shows large tongue, uh, small and short neck narrow airway, uh, it, it really wasn't good to start off with. And unfortunately, when she was put to sleep, we attempted to spray the cords. There was a grade four view, so no view of the larynx whatsoever. She also had a, a macrostomia, which is a, a, a gap between the lips on the right-hand side, so bagging uh, 
was very difficult as the mask couldn't create a good seal. Um, when if we provide, tried to perform jaw thrusts and chin lift, her jaw was fixed. So all of these meant that her stats dropped and we couldn't tube her. Uh, we were in a can't intubate, can't ventilate scenario and we discussed options. Um, it was felt that we should proceed with an emergency tracheostomy and this was done uh, within five minutes. The anaesthetic gases were simply piped into the patient's mouth and uh, the tracheostomy will, be, will remain for the foreseeable future. These were some live pictures of me during the procedure. We obviously don't have videos of those really difficult airways because uh, it's kind of frowned upon videoing that sort of embarrassment. So case two um, is a four week old girl um, in a different country. Mum unfortunately had some postnatal psychosis and at home tried to decapitate the baby. She cut across the whole neck all the way down to the vertebral body. Uh, this was a hugely distressing case for all involved and dad brought rushed the child to A&E um, and the initial management was was very difficult. There was a lot of blood. Um, the plan at that stage was to intubate directly through the neck. So an ET tube was placed into the open trachea. Cuff was inflated and airways was secured while they were transferred to a different hospital. And the child did very well. The ET tube was changed for a tracheostomy by the ENT surgeons uh, uh, in theatre. And at two years of age, the only repercussions she had of this were bilateral vocal cord palsy. These are a series of pictures starting in the bottom left corner of her bilateral vocal cord palsy. And this is how we would manage these uh, ENT patients. So uh, we spread the cords, incise through the cricoid ring, and the middle picture at the top shows us inserting a rib graft uh, posteriorly. And the one on the top right shows glue squirted over this. Uh, a tube was then placed for a week and this next video shows when we took the tube out how things look after a week and it demonstrates that she uh, has a good wide uh, subglottis um, and she was able to be decannulated uh, following this. So this is the third case. This is a 20 month old child who had been experiencing and diagnosed with recurrent croup on an increasingly frequent and severe basis. They had attended uh, accidents and emergency and had been referred as an outpatient to ENT. We like to see patients after the third bout of croup and pay particular attention to kids who are getting worse over time with increasingly frequent bouts. In the meantime, the child went for a routine urological procedure and at the time of induction, they were unable to pass a tube this video uh, uh, shows what ENT saw when they were called to the patient. It's a bronchoscopy which uh, identifies an extremely narrow airway due to laryngeal stenosis, which was congenital. This child had been breathing through a hole up just less than uh, two millimeters uh, and uh, was obviously doing diff was having difficulty at home, uh, but this was uh, worsened whenever they had their uh, induction. The management of this patient was to have bag and mask ventilation and be transferred in an ambulance to a specialist hospital where we performed tracheostomy the same day on a planned emergency list. The longer term plan for this patient was that we uh, did an elective laryngotracheal reconstruction, which means opening the neck doing a laryngo fissure and putting a rib graft at the back of his larynx and at the front, securing these uh, and putting a stent in. And this video shows the stent being removed after three weeks, uh, hopefully to reveal an excellent airway. This patient was then able to be decannulated from the tracheostomy at three months. This fourth case, I suppose, is uh, an excellent example of airway, foreign body and how to manage them and how they can be extremely difficult. It's, it's often um, a bone of contention in terms of the management of patients who come to a peripheral hospital, uh, whether or not the airway, foreign body should be attempted to be removed there or should they should be transferred. And if they're transferred, how does that happen? Should they be intubated? Uh, should they be put in an ambulance? Should they go in their own car?
So this uh, nine month old, without a great history um, of a possible foreign body, developed some strider. They attended a, a peripheral hospital and dad wanted to bring the patient directly to, uh, to the specialist center. I think this video shows uh, just how difficult a tracheal foreign body can be. Uh, as we move down, we can see that there's a jumbo peanut obstructing the entire airway just above the carina. In these circumstances, if the child is attempted to be intubated, that's not going to work uh, and you can make a very bad situation much worse. Uh, the recommendation was to put the child into a, uh, an ambulance along with an anaesthetist and bring them straight to theatre in the specialist hospital where we were able to remove the foreign body using optical grasping forceps. I have helpfully edited out the two and a half minutes of panic with SATs of 25. Uh, the patient did very well and was fit enough to go home the next day. So I suppose my take home messages to, uh, today uh, are that surgical access to the anterior neck is an absolute last resort. It should be done as a life-saving intervention. Before that, get all the, me the expert members of the team that you can involved and manage these airways as you would in APS guidelines. Uh, I would welcome any questions.